The readings taken from John 14, verses 12 to 26. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot, cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me any more, but you will see me, because I, because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Who, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own, they belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Thank you. You know, I don't believe that when the disciples heard those words, they understood a thing that Jesus was talking about. <laughs> you know, what's this talk of the Holy Spirit coming and being with them and, uh, and, and talking to them about things that uh, uh, Jesus had said, yet not said? All very confusing, kind of a, a Trinitarian passage to people who had yet to experience the Trinity. Question. Did the disciples have the Holy Spirit when they were with Jesus? No, they didn't. The Holy Spirit hadn't been given to people when they were with Jesus. It was only after Pentecost that they had the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself says, you know him because he is with you and will be in you. So Jesus was talking to them, but really he was talking to us. The words that he was saying to them, they didn't understand. It was only after, once they'd received the Spirit, that they understood. Ah, now we know what you're talking about. <laughs> now we've tasted and seen. Now we've felt and experienced. Now we understand. We're going to be looking at Trinity in a moment. Before, we're going to sing. If we find it hard to understand or talk about the Trinity, well, we're not alone. During the early centuries, there were many different creeds or statements of belief. They were used in church, often in services of baptism, as we do, and sometimes used as confessional statements with questions and answers, again, like, like we do. There was very little friction or dissent because there were standard common features to all of them, that kind of Trinitarian pattern of a bit about God the Father, a bit about God the Son, and a bit about the Holy Spirit, with the bit about God the Son expanded to include some of his life and work. Uh, the version that we used earlier was based on the Apostles' Creed, which is probably one of the earliest in general circulation, though not necessarily written down. But we have to remember that in the early centuries, when people spoke their faith and shared their faith and talked about their faith, and they didn't have the internet, they didn't have text messages or phones. If you wanted to pass information on, you had to find somebody who could write and write it down on expensive pieces of paper and take it to an address 
and has that shared out in a church. So uh, when you talk about doctrine uh, and it's read out and someone asks a question and say, oh, don't know about that, you know, can we work it out from this? No, we've got to go back. So it gets sent back to the church and they talk to other people. It's a long and complicated process. Whereas nowadays we just click Google and, um, and we get an answer. Uh, and if, 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 you, if you're stupid, you believe it because there's loads of stuff on the internet that's not true. Yeah, it's right, it's right, you know. Loads of stuff on the internet is not true. You don't have to believe it because Google said so. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of freedom I've given you this morning to disagree with Google. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the creeds, how did they come about? How did we get a statement of belief that, that has been passed down through the centuries to us today? Well, it started with, um, if we can have that first slide back up then, uh, Arius, Prince of Alexandria in Egypt. He first attempted it in the year 318 with a statement that's based on a hierarchical Trinitarian structure. First you've got God the Father, creator of all that is, and then came God the Son, and then came God the Holy Spirit. One proceeds from the other. Uh, it's, it's known as a hierarchical order um, and kind of accepted as an order of importance. But I think it's, it's just easier to say it's a chronological sequence. Now, how did God reveal himself to the world? Well, first, uh, as, as Father, as Creator. Second, as Son, as Redeemer. Thirdly, as Holy Spirit, indwelling God. Constantine took over the empire in 325 and established Christianity uh, as the religion of the empire. He tried to unite the empire under one creed, a, a synod in Antioch, in Syria. And an agreement was reached on the first version of what we know as the Nicene Creed. Uh, if you look up in the Methodist Worship Book, it's there for you, page 190, you, you can see a full version of the Nicene Creed. But the third person of the Trinity was at this point only read as, I believe in the Holy Spirit, which could of course mean anything. Arianism continued to flourish, but a strong attempt was made by Basil of Caesarea to counter it with a theology of the right and left hand of God. So, if you like, retaining the kind of the elevated status of, of father as being above all and over all, but saying that the son and the spirit were on God's right and left hand, separate from, but kind of of most importance. It didn't gain a lot of strength, but it did contribute to the argument. Arianism continued to flourish. The real challenge and the eventual defeat for Arianism came from Athanasius. Uh, If you've got a scholarly mind uh, and you want to to go a little bit deeper, just look up Athanasian Creed. Uh, It's it's very, very long. It takes a lot of reading into, but it's it's probably one of the best attempts to define what Christians believe. It has an expanded theology of the Holy Spirit, which formed the basis of the expanded form of the Nicene Creed, which we have today. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son together is worshipped and glorified. In other words, it puts the Holy Spirit on the same level as the Father and the Son. And that was confirmed um, at the Council of Constantinople in 381. But it was without that last clause, the filioque clause. So the Holy Spirit was still kind of secondary in the order of merit. Father and Son were seen as equal by the church, but the Holy Spirit was something, someone that proceeded from the Father and the Son. It was in 451 AD that the Council of Chalcedon Uh, accepted the Nicene Creed as orthodox for both the Western and the Eastern churches. But this filioque clause, yeah, do you want to just click it one more time? Yeah, this filioque clause 
the and the sun part owes its origin to Augustine. That's 354 to 430. He developed that view of scripture on John 14, 15 to 26, which was read for us earlier. It's a view that existed in the Athanasian Creed and was known to be accepted in the Western Church in 447, but it was never accepted by the Eastern Church. It was finally proclaimed at the Third Council of Toledo in 589, when it was probably inserted into the Nicene Creed. But it was at the centre of East and Western Church debates for the rest of the millennia. It was not until the year 1014 that finally the filioque clause was accepted by the West. So if we can go on to the next slide. There we have. The Western Church accepting the equality of the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But the Eastern Orthodox Church, so that which took its lead from Constantinople, Constantinople or Istanbul as we read it today, the, the Eastern European churches, if you go to them today and talk about the Trinity, they will say, well, actually it's Father and Son and, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from, so is not equal to. It's still a matter of divide between the Eastern and Western churches. Just as an aside, the Western church decided many, many years ago that in an attempt to find unity between East and West, if it meant dropping the filio clause, the and the sun clause, then the Western church would be prepared to lose that uh, in the cause of unity. Um, we don't need to worry because it will never happen but uh, I, I just let you know that uh, it's still a matter of debate in the church okay it's all a bit academic that but it, it's, it, it gives you an idea that, that the, the doctrines that we have today didn't just drop out of heaven fully formed the church has had to wrestle with its understanding of scripture and the revelation of God through, throughout history, and it still wrestles today. The creeds are just an attempt to find an absolute definition for God and a unity of Christian belief according to our best reason and understanding as we have it today. And this is where the difficulty lies. And if you go back to St. Augustine, there's a story that he relates to that says that while puzzling over the doctrine of the Trinity, he was walking along a beach and he observed a young boy running backwards and forwards, trying to take water from the sea and put it into the hole. And Augustine said to him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm trying to fit this sea into the hole. And it was at that point that Augustine realised that what he had been trying to do is put the infinite God into a finite mind. And as soon as you set a limit and a definition, God will do something that says, I don't fit. Because God cannot be bound by human intelligence or imagination. God is not an object that can be observed and defined by absolutes. He is known as one who is real and living and active in human experience. And we try to interpret that experience to discover more about God. But it's experience that's the domain of the grassroots of the church, where Christians have practiced theology long before the theologians have, have come along and formalised belief into doctrine. We say, this is how I've experienced God, so what does it mean? What does it tell us about God? And the scholars try to work that out. It can be said that the church believes before it understands. It practices its doctrine before it declares a formal statement of it. And that's just as well, because that means that God is accessible to you and I to ordinary people, and we don't have to be super brains, we don't have to have marvellous intelligence or degrees. What we need to be able to do is to recognise God in our lives and in the ordinary. And we can do that 
because he sent the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, living and working in the world today, we can know God with us, Emmanuel. So we don't need to fully understand or be confident in explaining the meaning of the Trinity. People of other faiths or none will ask you, how do you believe in three gods? You say there's one God, but you believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You can't have one and three. You say, I don't know. But someone does. Yeah. Somebody has worked it out. If they want the answers, they're there. But what you do know is how you experience God. The Trinity is simply a doctrine that's formulated to describe our knowledge and experience. God created the world, God entered the world, and God lives in the world. And that's the Trinity. As we know it, as we experience it, God has entered the world, so God has created the world, God has entered the world, and God lives in the world. We may not be able to communicate a doctrine effectively in our language, but that doesn't stop us from demonstrating it in our lives. We don't need to understand energy conversion to be able to show someone that when you press a switch, a light comes on. We might not understand the science, but we understand the practicality. Press that switch, something happens. And for most of us, that's how it is with God. The things that we do can express the truth that we believe. That God created the world. I think the church is being chastised by, by society, by the modern world, who have recognised that the, the, that the human life has not treated creation as it should have. That we have abused and mistreated creation and now we have all kinds of councils and conferences that get together to tell us how we can address climate change, how we can be less malicious towards creation, how we can recycle and reuse rather than create and destroy. We are learning from the world what we were told once from our scriptures. That God created and it was good and he left human beings to look after it and we've made a mess. So we need to put it right. So we have the, the freedom and responsibility to care for that garden, the whole of creation. We have a redeeming God as well. We have one who not only changes our relationship through forgiveness and new start, but one who changes our behaviour. That when we recognise Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, then we want to imitate his life in the ways that we live and work. Then, then we recognise too that love changes behaviour and example changes behaviour. Let me tell you how love changes behaviour. When I was 16, I fell in love for the first time. I knew I'd fallen in love, or if you like, I realised I'd fallen in love because I did things that I didn't normally do. I was going out with a girl who lived two miles away from me. And when we went out, I would take her home and then I would walk the two miles back home by myself late at night. I didn't do that. That was not kind of on my agenda. I, I, I had a... Uh, a motorcycle or a push bike before that but I used other means of propulsion rather than the two that are underneath my pelvis <laughs> but I did that and, and when I went round in the afternoons I would do the washing up when we'd eaten and, and you might think, oh, Billy was just doing that to be a nice boy and to impress their parents. I wasn't doing that at all. In fact, I, at the time, I didn't know why I was doing it because I never washed up, ever. You know, and I still don't do it if I can help it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did realise that my behaviour had changed because I had fallen in love with someone else. And, and you know, 
You know, for us Christians, when we fall in love with Jesus, that should affect the way we, we live, the way we change, the way we relate to other people. Not because we've changed our mind, but because Jesus has changed our hearts. Because we have discovered a love that we didn't know before. And so we reflect that love of God through Jesus in the way we react with others. And we give an example to others. I was once in a church uh, on a Sunday evening and it was winter and it was snowing. And it had snowed really hard in church. And I came out and all the cars were covered with snow. And I thought, ah, oh, it's a pain. I've got to wipe the snow off the windscreen before I can go. So I wiped all the snow off my car. Uh, and, and then I thought, I can't just get in my car and drive away with all these other cars here. So I started cleaning the snow off the car next to me. And someone came out of church after I'd cleaned it a fair bit and said, oh, Billy, so you've got a new car. And I said, no, I'm just cleaning the car, snow off here. Cause I've, I've done mine. I thought I might as well do this one as well. And he went and cleaned the snow off his car and he saw that I was still cleaning snow off other cars. And he said, I suppose I'd better help you then. And he started cleaning snow off the cars as well. And, and before we knew it, other people had come out and everybody had joined in and all the cars in the car park had been cleaned. From the one example uh, that, that I set. I didn't tend to set an example, it just caught on. Funny enough, next time it snowed outside the church, I found I had to do it again. Because something had got into my head that said, you can't just please yourself, you need to help others as well. And so my example became an example to me. I've not had many experiences since, but I still reckon that if I find myself in a car park with snow on the windscreen, I, I am going to clean the car next to me. Because it's in me now, it's part of me. And I wouldn't mind betting that the other people who are in the car park too feel the same, that when they clear snow off their windscreen, they probably thought, oh, last time I did this, I had to go and do all the other cars as well. Because example changes behaviour. And Jesus gave the greatest example at all. He said, I'll put myself aside so that you can walk free. I'll clean it off my car, but I'll clean it off yours as well so you don't have to do it. We illustrate redemption in the way we live our lives and the way we treat others, the way we serve. And finally, we illustrate God lives in the world by the inspiration and the envisioning and the prompting and the feelings of the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us. As I said before, the Holy Spirit is probably the hardest aspect of God to understand. But how do we experience the Holy Spirit? I'll give you a story from just uh, a, a few weeks ago. We're living down in Rustington with our trouble finding a church. Uh, at least one where we feel that it, it's right for us to go to. Uh, and Pauline was, uh, had been getting a little bit anxious and, uh, uh, and worried that, you know, what's going to happen when I finish here? Um, you know, where are we going to go to? How are we going to worship? None of the churches we've found so far. Uh, and I, I said to her, you don't need to worry, Paul. God has got this under control. You, you see, if you remember, you know, nine months ago, we didn't know what we were doing and suddenly God opened up his plan and I got the letter saying, will you come to East Grinstead? And it has been so right for me and for you, I'm sure. Uh, because it felt right. I to already told God I weren't interested and then he, he sends me a letter and it feels right. That's the Holy Spirit within, prompting us. So I said, I, said, I expect God's got something in store for us and we don't need to worry about it. A couple of weeks later, I was speaking to a chairman of the district. He said, Billy, I need to have a word with you. He said, I've got something I need you to think and pray about. He said, I don't know if it's going to happen yet, but would you be interested? I can't tell you yet, because it might not happen. But I didn't need to consider it. The, the answer is yes. You know, whatever the details are, whatever it requires, yes. Your heart's right with my heart. I feel the Spirit saying, whatever. Here I am, Lord, send me. So I didn't need to worry at all, but Pauline hadn't had that. And she was still thinking, what, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? So we went along to the church in Goring, Methodist church there, uh, and to try it out, suss them out. <laughs> and, and we found it to be 
a very welcoming church, a very friendly church. Things are going on, a spiritual technology worked. <laughs> uh, and, and I thought, yeah, this is, a, this is not too bad, this. But Pauline became more convinced that it was right. Uh, and she felt there would be a place for her to, in the music. So we were going along to the church last week and Pauline said before she went, I'm just going to write the dates that I'll be available for the rest of the plan in case I've got any gaps. <laughs> so she turns up and she sees the steward after. <coughs> well, I have trouble telling this. And the steward, steward said that morning she was in the bath and she was praying that God would say send a musician <laughs> she said my prayers don't normally get answered that quick it was confirmation for Pauline that it was the right church for her it was confirmation for the, the steward that God knew what he was doing but we read in scripture that before you call I will answer you know, we, we read in scripture that you don't know what to pray for, but the Spirit intercedes for us. And the Spirit interceded for that lady, the steward, that day, that she would pray. Not that that was going to make it happen, but that she would see that God is in control, that God is already active in the world, and that before she even calls, he's got it taken care of. How do we know the spirit in the world? We know it through the things that happen to us, through the prayers that we make and others make, through the services that we offer, through the things that we see and do, through the promptings that we see and feel inside. We are all a trinity of, of person. We have a body through which we can see one another and we interact with the world physically. We have a mind through which we interpret the things that happen in the world and we understand how and why the world works. And we have a spirit that is able to respond to the promptings of God and to feel emotion and to, to, to recognise the other about us. So in our care for the environment and our good stewardship of resources, we show our loyalty to God who entrusts his creation to us. In our prayers and our worship, we show our love for God who has restored us to a relationship through him, to himself, through his Son. In a, and in our obedience to Jesus' teaching and our loving service to others, we show that the power of the Spirit brings in God's kingdom through us. <laughs>